This is the story of a kitchen where dinners no longer simmer, but beef get cut open, ripped apart, and hastily poured out before ending up as a meal. Convenience food is primarily cartons, plastic, tins. It's sad, but it saves time. Ten years ago, the French took an hour to cook a nice meal. Today, they spend half that time, half an hour at most. At the supermarket, the top three ready-to-eat meals are first and foremost pizza. Next come regional recipes like cassoulet, then finally tinned pasta. Ready-to-eat meals account for 22 kilos of food sold per second in France. Seven Frenchmen out of ten have given in to the trend, especially young people. But do they know that these industrial preparations are an important factor in triggering certain diseases? We can no longer go on like this, with 45% of the population showing signs of chronic illnesses. Today, researchers and scientists agree in saying that eating this type of food is a medical time bomb. And each and every one of us is affected by the problem, and that's what's so serious, really. We're going to tell you why the food industry isn't doing much about it, despite warnings. We're in a status quo situation. How does all this affect your budget? Such questions would never have arisen in our grandmother's kitchens. Joanna and Bruno are in their 30s. They have two children. And like many young people today, did not inherit the culinary talents of their parents. Quite the contrary. I've got my bag, honey. Come over here. Once a week, they go to the supermarket, where they actually buy three vegetables to give themselves a good conscience. But what they really prefer is on the shelves in the next aisle. Yeah, let's take those too. Ready to eat meals make up two thirds of their grocery shopping. Quite a lot of choice, haven't we? Take some Indian. There's Indian. And that's how it's been since they've been together. I'll take that one. With mouth watering photos on the packages, these young parents compose all their menus from images. It's very appetizing. Look at it. I look a lot at the pictures. I know it's wrong, but... I look at the brand names more than the pictures. For me, the image counts a lot. You can see what you're going to eat, or you think you can. No, I don't like it. Packaging is the first key to success for convenience food. With their carefully designed packages, they're a concept before being a meal. So let's take a soup. I like this one with fresh cream. I like that one there. At the checkout desk, there's not a lot of food on the conveyor belt, but the bill is still quite hefty. That's 176 and three, please. And Joanna starts having doubts about the price of all these ready-made meals. If we bought some pasta and made a pasta dish ourselves instead of buying pasta bogs, I'm sure it would cost less. These popular pasta boxes that give Joanna pause are actually the hit of the moment. Pasta cooked in containers that you can reheat in the microwave in just two minutes. We're going to the Vendée, where they're made. Christelle Buetas is the marketing director of Sodebo. For two years, she's been what's behind the success of this little box, which is the envy of her competitors. Today, 350,000 boxes a week are made. So it's a big production site. And a highly protected production site as well. No one is allowed inside for fear of industrial espionage. Filming was possible, however, on consumer tests that were being conducted on two of the latest recipes. One with spicy peppers, the other with asparagus. 
As with fashion designers, a new collection comes out every season. Today, the brand offers 29 products. And 20 million boxes have been sold this year, six times more than at the beginning. It's slightly spicy, isn't it? Is it a strong taste? Yeah. The spicy taste lasts a long time. That explains a glass of water, right? A craze created by the concept itself. It was invented two years ago, geared at lunchtime office workers. And as so often, the idea came from the United States. The box allows the consumer to have open contact with his colleagues. And for the French, conviviality is very, very important, whether they're eating in the office or at home. When you have a plate or a cook dish, you concentrate on the product, whereas when you have the box, you bring the box to you. So suddenly, you're in a position of openness, of conversation, so you have a way of eating that's much more relaxed, freer, you might say something you always see with people eating an American TV series. We would like to have known more about its preparation. Where do the ingredients come from? What's the sauce made of? Is everything 100% natural? But that's where we got stuck. The majority of the food industry giants refuse to open their factory doors to us. Are they afraid that consumers might turn their backs on this market that's worth more than 3 billion euros? We contacted the biggest names in the sector. The leader made us wait an eternity. The second made it understood that they weren't available. In short, we had many refusals, often without justification. We can't allow you to film in our factory. A whole panoply of not very convincing excuses. At Captainac in the Aveyron, we were given an interview with one of the few companies that agreed to let us film, Renal et Roclore, 120 years in the business. When we asked to film their flagship product, a top-of-the-range cassoulet, they were totally willing. Here's how the dish is prepared. First, two types of pork meat are mixed, one lean, the other fatty. They are kneaded together with the condiments. The mixture is made into sausages that are individually placed into the canning jars by hand. Then, a piece of pork and white beans are added. Finally, for the sauce, carrots, onions, goose fat and rind are used. In short, high quality products of which the brand has been able to decrease the levels of fat. But obviously, it makes it a little more expensive. There are cost differences. Fatty meat obviously costs less than lean meat. The ratio is about one to five, perhaps even more. So we might be tempted to use more fat, but a sausage that's too fatty is not really any good. 7,000 cassoulets an hour are produced in this factory. The retail price is four euros. But this producer doesn't only make this top-of-the-range cassoulet with goose fat. They also make, under the same label, a standard product, sold at half the price of the superior one. The notion of price is very important. Some consumers buy the superior cassoulet, some buy the standard. We have to respect these goals. In order to do so, we use very different preparations. Different preparations. But on the photos, there are some nice-looking pieces of meat. But what's really in it? Looking closely at the label, it's as if we were reading in a foreign language. Some very funny words appear. Sodium glutamate, processed corn and potato starch. All these ingredients are additives. Some preserve, some enhance taste, color or volume. They all cost less than a raw material. There's nothing illegal about them, 
But are all these chemical ingredients really safe? In Clermont-Ferrand, a consumer protection association investigates. So everybody choose a label at random. Two indispensable tools for the participants, a magnifying glass and a decoder. I have emulsifier E471, stabilizer E480, antioxidant E304. On the labels, the additives are often indicated by the letter E, which means Europe, followed by three numbers that vary according to the category. There are 26 in all. These substances are, in fact, generally added to processed foods to improve their color and conservation. They're also added to foods to allow them to heat up faster or to give them a better consistency. Each of these categories is the subject of scientific debate. This is worrying as some of these are considered dangerous to the health of people who consume them. Sodium glutamate, potato malatextrin, I don't know what they are. Tomato powder, I don't know what that is either. And what's beginning to worry consumers is not the additives individually, but their accumulation. By what? Sodium bisulfate? Processed cornstarch. Wheat, dextrose, stabilizer, E451. At each meal, we might eat more than 20 of them. Every day, we're shoveling additives into our mouths without being aware of it. Anyone need a magnifying glass? <laughs> when we try to negotiate, the food industry only answers. But it's authorized. And it's true that their product, when purchased as it is, is not necessarily toxic in itself. But the question we're asking ourselves today concerns the accumulation of these products. And maybe she's not wrong. The internationally renowned publication The Lancet published a scientific study on such accumulations. For the first time, English researchers discovered an additive cocktail. According to the study, artificial colorings and sodium benzoate, or a combination of the two, increase hyperactivity in three-year-old children, as well as in eight to nine-year-olds. These colorings are called E102, 104, 110, 122, 124, and 129. As for sodium benzoate, it's known as E211. These additives were not outlawed after the study. However, last year, the European Union started requiring manufacturers to stipulate the risk of hyperactivity on their labels. Today, this has resulted in manufacturers replacing chemical colorings with natural ones. However, we still found in this salad bought in the supermarket and in these shrimp, the infamous sodium benzoate, or E211. Nutritionist Dr. Laurent Chevalier has been fighting against additives in our food for more than 20 years. In his opinion, this is just the beginning. He advises limiting their intake to a minimum. I think what we should tell the consumer is that if there are more than three additives, you should put the product back on the shelf, or only buy it every once in a while, because in the end, we don't know much about the interactions between additives. They haven't been studied. The methodology needed to study this has not yet been developed. Today, more than 300 additives are authorized in France. That means hundreds of thousands of combinations are possible. To date, there is no scientific study that can establish the safety of these interactions. In short, what's on our plates is unknown. Furthermore, are all these additives useful? Like those used in these so-called chicken wings, for example. The testers who are working for a consumer information internet site were completely stunned. When we carried out the test on these chicken wings, we discovered that they don't exist in nature. For example, a chicken doesn't have a wing. We take a piece of its white meat and add a bone. Then we try to make it stick together. And so we have to use some sort of product or other to make it all hold together. So here we use additives, substances that make the bone stick to the flesh. 
The flesh itself comes from several different pieces of chicken. We won't explain all of this in detail, but when you study it, you understand that in the end, the closer you remain to the original product, the better off you are. Except that it's not quite so simple, as these testers demonstrate thanks to a new experiment. We're in a house in the Paris suburbs. Elizabeth is about to show how hard it is for mothers to go against their children's tastes. I'm going to get my ingredients out and prepare a chicken cordon bleu. Every month, Elizabeth tests out a new recipe on her kids and their friends. Here, she's chosen a dish that her children often ask for, chicken cordon bleu. I take my breast. Now I'm going to put a slice of ham on it. Her aim is to try five different chicken recipes. First, the homemade one. Now I fold it. She soaks it in egg and breadcrumbs. Now, the butcher's recipe. In fact, I asked my butcher when I bought the chicken breast if he made his cordon bleus himself. And he said no, <laughs> it's an industrial product. And finally, a well-known chicken cordon bleu brand name. One low-priced brand, and one from a brand of frozen foods. Here you are now, Raphael. I hope you're hungry. There's quite a few of them. Start with the thinnest one. What do you think about the saltiness of this one? It's not very salty. I can taste the cheese more. All right, taste the other one now. I've got more of a chicken taste. Dry, drier. Yeah, a little drier. I think it tastes like sushi. The chicken, well, for me, this is not chicken anymore. It's not a fillet. You can't see the chicken's fibres. What grade would you give this one? Six. For the moment. Six out of ten. To the mother's horror, the children prefer the industrial fillets. And in her opinion, the additives are surely responsible for this. It contains flavour enhancers. These additives enhance the taste and the odour. It also contains emulsifying salts, which are additives that allow fats to be distributed homogeneously. For example, I see there's dextrose, which is the equivalent of glucose. It's a sugar, so sugar's been added. All these additives worry Elizabeth. For her, industrial foods make the children used to certain tastes, which they then become dependent upon. Given the number of additives in these products, I really have no desire to eat them anymore. The cheese is reconstituted, the ham is reconstituted, and the chicken, most of the time, is also reconstituted. Are we eating junk food when we eat that kind of thing? Oh, yes. If we stick strictly to the labels, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. Given the context, a few manufacturers have decided to take the bull by the horns. This was the case with Marie, number two in the convenience food sector. Recently, the company has gradually been removing additives from their recipes. We're in their factory in sablé sur sarthe where Marie produces 250,000 cartons a week. We chose one of their more successful dishes, cod in lemon sauce. Marie-Dominique Quignon and her research and development team worked six months replacing the additives in this dish, including the principal colorant. A little bit of turmeric gives the sauce a great color. Turmeric, a natural substance, replaced a chemical coloring. Theoretically, this sounds easy, but the team came up against problems. They had to be careful not to change the taste of the dish at the risk of upsetting their customer. For the lemon sauce, we need cream. 
Ten years ago, I would have said that the sauce was fluorescent yellow. It looked very chemical. That was due to the colorant. So uh, a colorant that today is no longer used in this recipe because, as you've seen, turmeric is used to brighten the dish. Those chemicals have been removed from our recipes. Consumers have concerns regarding these chemicals, so we've been trying for several years now to take them out. This means removing them from our own production. But also we've asked our suppliers to take them out from the raw materials. To the surprise of the factory manager... It was not so complicated and costly to go to the effort to remove the additives. But is a little bit of goodwill enough? We had to recalculate our temperatures on the raw materials we used as well. And that called for perfect regularity. Of course, it took a lot of grey matter. It took time to think about the best way of doing it, but in the end, it can also simplify a lot of other tasks. I would say that, depending on the recipes, well, it might end up a little more costly for some, and for others it comes out at the same price. Today, of the 61 prepared dishes made by this brand, 39 no longer contain additives. Eventually, these chemical substances will be completely removed from their recipes. This company has done its homework. Because, apart from the additives, it has also made an effort in regards to salt and fat. But surprisingly, nothing has forced it to. And that's where it's tough for the food industry. Salt. Fat. Sugar. There's no law forcing manufacturers to limit the quantities of these three ingredients in prepared foods. However, like additives, these substances are not always man's best friend. Cancer, obesity, cardiovascular diseases, excesses of salt, fat and sugar contribute to these diseases that cost the social security system 13 billion euros a year, more than the deficit of the health system. There are quite a few senators crying wolf. The composition of prepared foods shows a proportion of sugar, salt and fat that's much higher than the human body's daily requirement. Ministers in an awkward situation. I regret the absence of certain economic players at the meetings that took place. A charter that industrialists can adhere to exists, but there is nothing, absolutely nothing coercive about it. As a result, the majority of convenience foods still contain too much sugar, fat and salt for the medical profession. For the last 10 years now, the same voices have been speaking out and they've been preaching in the desert. Pierre Menton, a researcher at INSERM at the Paris Descartes Medical School, is Mr. Salt. He's the man who rang the alarm in 1998. But today, he's bordering on discouragement. Well, listen, as for the salt, here you have six piles of documents that represent merely a part of the articles that have been published in the last 40 years on the problem of the excessive use of salt. For the last 10 years, we've been trying to alert both health professionals and public authorities, as well as the general population, about the salt problem, without much success, unfortunately, as you can see. And so, nothing much has happened since, in spite of all the studies done. Pierre Menton doesn't even want to deal with the salt case anymore. There's too much inertia on the part of the industrialists. And yet, hypertension, notably due to this excess, affects 10 million people in France. Why is there still so little awareness? Back to Joanne and Bruno, the couple in their 30s who regularly buy prepared meals. Here, honey. They think they're being vigilant. So when they buy prepared foods, they buy healthy ones, such as this mushroom soup. After all, it's well known that soup is good for your health. 
Just, just a little. And it's full of vegetables. Mm. Why go to the trouble of making it if it's so good? That's the one I like. The only problem is you need a degree in nutrition to actually understand what's in it. At our request, Let's have a look at this label. Bruno agreed to look at the label a little closer for the first time. What do you like, then? We asked them to look at the salt content. It's 38%. This bowl of soup contains 38% of the quantity of salt that we should be eating per day. That's a lot, and the family is quite surprised. This means that here, we've eaten a third of our day's requirements with this soup. And that, my goodness, is quite a bit. And remember, this is just the starter. Go on, give me some more. We thought we'd have a little fun calculating the fat intake for that day. At noon, soup and pizza. In the evening, shepherd's pie and a chocolate eclair. With this industrial food alone, their recommended daily fat requirement, which is around 50 grams, has been reached. And this, without taking breakfast into account, the cold cuts as a starter or the cheese. In addition, some industrially made meals contain more fat than others, like this salmon that seems so light and yet alone contains half the daily requirements in lipids. For consumer associations, one of the solutions to avoid surpassing the daily requirements of sugar, fat, and salt is to change the labels on the packaging, which is still far too complicated to understand. Here they list the uh, carbohydrates, here the lipids, there's the sodium. It's an incomprehensible... In terms of nutrition labeling, what we want is a means that is simple, immediately understood, and that visually allows us to compare between categories of food that are more or less fatty or more or less sugary. Such a model already exists. The English model, for example, where very simple terms such as fat, sugars, or salt are used, you can recognize a food that is high in fats, sugars, or salt according to its color. Although this labeling is very clear, very explanatory, and immediately understandable, this system, unfortunately, will not be used in Europe, quite simply because of the relentless lobbying by the food industry, trying to prevent such a simple and comprehensible labeling. Clearly, the interest of the food industry is not to inform consumers about the real nutritional qualities of their products. There is also another alternative. To discover it, we must go to northern France. In the middle of the countryside, we have an appointment with the producer of a prepared food, but far, very far from the industrial kind. Edmond Engel set up his business several years ago. After a long career at one of the food industry giants, he wanted to return to more traditional methods. How much does that weigh? Oh, that's not very heavy. That one's about 40 kilos. Edmond values quality. He is proud of his pork, raised locally and healthily fed. They're fed grain, but very little linseed, proteins, with a diet that's not too heavy. Just look, you can see it. Look at the meat. It's firm. That means that it contains less water. And look at the fatty part. It hasn't grown too quickly. Because if you feed very, very fast, there's a tendency to become fatty. It's like a baby that's fed too much. Today, the team is preparing a cassoulet of freshly delivered pork. You will see that it's possible to make prepared foods without too much salt, fat or sugar. First they're deboned, then skinned. Once ground, the meat is made into sausages. To give them a more appetizing color, a natural colorant is added, chicory. The sausages are then packaged with beans and another piece of meat. In less than an hour after being made, 
They are cooked in an autoclave, a sort of a giant pressure cooker. The rapidity between the preparation and the cooking allows Edmond to use less salt than in industrially processed foods. He adds the salt to the ground meat before cooking. Now there, I use 20 grams of pepper and 120 grams of salt. That means we salt at 12 grams, whereas industrially up to 15 grams of salt are used. But we've committed ourselves to use less salt. And is it easy to use less salt? Well, it's easy if you work as we've done here. That is, if the preparation is packaged within the hour. If it had to wait until this evening, then there might not be enough salt to protect it. In that case, it would be better to use 15 grams. What does the salt do? It's a preservative. It prevents the growth of bacteria. As for the fat content, Edmond has also found a very simple solution. Would you make the sauce, please? For the sauce, he uses only water and never any sugar or additives, which are used in most industrial processes. She's added salt, pepper, and a little bit of jelly. There's nothing else. The water is calculated for cooking the beans to ensure that they become creamy and that the dish contains 15 to 20 percent sauce. Industrially, the sauce is very thick and often constitutes 50 percent of the preparation. What you need to know is that, and, and I'm not going to name any brands, of course, but there are many prepared dishes that you consume that are mixtures made in boilers, simply injected into a carton by a pressurized air tube, dose by dose. In doing so, the meat is destructured, and a lot of binders are used so that the mixture slips easily through the tubes. And what binders are used? Anything based on starch, anything that will thicken the sauce, because you want it to slip through the tubes. Are they products that are a little too fatty, too sugary? Too sugary for me, and perhaps a little too fatty as well. High-quality convenience food is thus possible, even if many people advocate a simple return to home cooking. In Le Mans, the director of the local health service has openly taken the lead. He encourages the inhabitants to eat better. Junk food strains his budget. So for several years now, an original initiative has attempted to attack the problem at all odds. It takes place here, in this kitchen of a technical college. So we're going to wash our hands, put on an apron and get to it. All the inhabitants of the region who have health or weight problems are invited. It's free. It's simple. On today's program, healthy cooking. I've just retired. I worked very irregular working hours. I ate very poorly prepared foods that I don't think were very healthy. And as I have high cholesterol, I thought that I'd better do something about it. So I enrolled in this course. I weighed 92 kilos. I wasn't very pleased with the way I looked. And I still wanted to play sports, but couldn't. And I was too... Oh, there's also age to take into account, but, well, the, the weight really did it, so... Right, we're going to shell the peas, but first we're going to turn the oven on. On the menu, cold pea soup and duck fillets with turnips. Now here, the stock will be used as a condiment. It already has a lot of salt, so we're going to avoid adding any more. We'll correct the seasoning at the end. Here, we can actually control what's in the soup. Dried or packaged soup contain much more fat, thickness and salt than the homemade soup. So you don't consume as much as in the side dish or a garni. No, I was never taught that. 
This is Joel's third cooking class. He's lost five kilos, stopped eating convenience food, and uses less sugar. Joel is delighted, but he's also a joker, particularly as he's the only man, apart from the chef, amongst all these women. So quickly a discussion begins, why do people cook less than before? We have all the things to do. We don't have the time. Of course, I agree. I don't want to sound misogynist, but the fact that more and more women are working, that's also a problem. It's not a problem, on the contrary. Uh, yes, on the contrary, it is a problem. No one has ever prevented men from cooking, right? They also work. That consumers consume more prepared food is also, well, because men as well don't have the time. It's not because the women work. Yeah. Well, it shouldn't be. No, it shouldn't be. Yeah. Here is the finished dish. There's a little bit of fat in it, in addition to the small amount of olive oil that was used to marinate the pieces of duck. The duck itself obviously contains some fat. But in a commercial preparation, the fats essentially come from the fats added to the sauce. Generally, all prepared dishes contain sauce, and the fats come from this sauce. These fats are more saturated and much less interesting in terms of fatty acids compared to a prepared dish. Our dish is going to be less salty and less fatty and have a real interest for its protein content. 1,500 people have already followed this program organized by the Health Service of Le Mans. The result? Less medicines consumed. Fewer visits to the doctor and, above all, 200 million euros saved. Reason enough to extend the project to other French departments. But even if all these initiatives have given positive results, gray area concerning the ingredients used in prepared foods. No regulations require industrialists to list the origin of their ingredients. One of particular interest, chicken. We're off to Brazil the leading provider of chicken for French convenience food. In Brazil, chicken is 30% cheaper than in France. Brazil is also a country with far more lenient rules concerning poultry farming. Are Brazilian chickens a health risk? In the south of the country, nearly 2,500 farmers work for a French company, the Du Group. It sells part of its poultry production on the local market and the rest to the rest of the world, including France. In France, the chicken is never imported whole, but always arrives dismembered in order to be incorporated into convenience food. The group forbids all visits to its sites, officially for sanitary reasons. Despite this ban, a farmer accepted to receive us on condition of anonymity. Brazilian chickens are slaughtered much younger than in France, at 30 days while even in the most intensive poultry farms in France, it's 42. Here, they're 18 days old. They'll live until 30 days. I work for the Do Group, and their requirements are chickens of one kilo, 300 grams. The Do Group provides the chicks and the feed. In fact, the farmer is ignorant of what he gives his chickens to eat. The group furnishes him with feed without any details about its composition. I think that these rations are adapted to each period of the chicken's growth cycle. Certain rations have the development of the chicken. I have no access to the composition of the feed, but there are probably growth factors. The problem is that there are different growth factors, natural ones and those that contain antibiotics. In France, the latter are forbidden. In Brazil, on the contrary, they're used frequently. Mixed with feed, they stimulate the development of the chicks and prevent bacterial infection. In order to know more, we made an appointment in Sao Paulo with a veterinary professor at one of the leading universities in the country. 
Esses medicamentos eles eles diminuem muito a mortalidade inicial. These medicines greatly decrease the mortality of the poultry. Infecções que afetam o trato digestório. They prevent digestive and respiratory infections. Você tem But these products also allow the chickens to produce more meat. Without these products, raising poultry is more complicated and more expensive. 30% to 100% more expensive. But do these antibiotics, so useful for increasing production, find their way onto our tables? Or are they reserved solely for the local market? We return to the farmer and mention the two principal antibiotics that are banned in France in order to see if he's heard of them. Do you think that growth factors such as virgin niamycin or zinc bacteriacin are used? No. No. I've never heard anything about them. Does he know if these products are authorized in the countries towards which his chickens are exported, particularly France? No. I don't know. And does he know what they're used for? No. The man says he relies entirely on the French industrial group and for respecting the law as well. The Du group manages the entire production process. They're the ones that deal with the legislation. We're just a link in the chain. Virgin niamycin is an antibiotic that is widely used in Brazil. The product containing it is called Stepac. To know more, we contacted its manufacturer, pretending to be a breeder who wished to export to France. You sell to the Du Group? Yes, to Du and to Frangosul. Oh, Du is the owner of Frangosul. Yes. And do they buy Stepac from you? Yes, Stepac and Abiax as well. The manufacturer confirmed that Du bought this antibiotic. In any case, its use is perfectly legal in Brazil. But once again, how can we be sure that this drug is not found in chickens exported to France? Can controls alone supply the answer? We contacted the Brazilian Minister of Agriculture. We requested an interview with the CIF the organization that manages the controls before exportation. We received a flat refusal by email. No interview was granted. We returned to the farmer, who informed us that he is usually inspected by his own employer. Every day I note the mortality rate, and every week, how much the chickens weigh. Does the Du group come to control your farm? Yes, a technician comes to verify the quality of the water. He comes two or three times a month, and he looks at these records in which we must record everything. Are you controlled by the Ministry of Agriculture? No. But when the chickens leave for the slaughterhouse, we indicate the standards applied during the production. Are these controls sufficient? Especially as certain prohibited products leave no trace in the meat. Such is the case with Stafak, a product based on virginiamycin. An official of the company which manufactures the product confirmed it over the telephone. If I use this product for exportation, will anyone find its trace? That depends upon which countries you're exporting to. Europe has banned it. Even if it leaves no trace, you cannot use it for ethical reasons. But if I use it, will anyone know? No, it will not appear in any controls that leaves no trace. As Virginia Myerson leaves no trace, it's impossible to know if Stafak has been used in the productions of chickens exported to France. Naturally, we asked too. The group confirmed that they maintained entire control over all their exportation channels. By email, the director of communications told us that the group only exported 2% of its Brazilian production to Europe and that no poultry destined for the European market contained growth factors. Our products are subject to permanent and certified checks, and every shipment is issued with a health certificate delivered by the competent national authorities. 
In addition, upon delivery of a shipment, our clients carry out their own controls on the basis of perfectly defined specifications. But from the French Ministry of Agriculture, we learned absolutely nothing about the controls undertaken in France, regardless of our numerous requests for an interview. So how can we eat differently, better and above all cheaper? In Clermont-Ferrand, we found a group of informed consumers. Here, they will attempt an original experiment. They're going to test two versions of a dish that is known to everyone, spaghetti bolognese, and to compare the prepared version against the homemade version. I've bought pasta. We're going to use pasta, tomato sauce, which contains neither colorants nor preservatives. Little olive oil, tomato paste, onion and garlic. The object is to ascertain the difference in price between the two dishes. The participants of this workshop all have very limited budgets for food, two euro per meal, such as Jean-Jacques, who lives alone in a hostel. A former cook, he manages to get by thanks to his skills. He very rarely eats prepared foods. Prepared foods are really very expensive. So you're going to eat a pizza. Well, that's at least four euros, four euros fifty maybe. But even if you cut it in half for two meals, it's still more than two euros per meal, just for a pizza. So even if you only eat a few raw vegetables with it for a balanced meal, and if you want a little bit of cheese or a small dessert, your meal's going to cost you four to five euros, and I can't do that. It's just not possible. For the group, it's time to taste and compare. The ready-made. For me, it has an aftertaste of cardboard. Penelope told you that the pasta box is €2.59 for a single portion. Here, we have cooked for 15 people at a cost of €1.20 per head. A better taste at half the price. The consumers prefer the homemade version. They can also express their choice next time they fill their shopping carts. Finally, and ultimately, it's still the consumer who has the power of decision. If I don't buy a particular product, the product will no longer be commercialized. I don't think that consumers are conscious of the power that they still have. Joanna has decided to change her eating habits. She has contacted Benjamin Dariouche, a coach who has a passion for cooking. He's recently started nutritional training sessions based on fresh products. His credo, to avoid prepared foods as much as possible, but without spending your life in the kitchen. Merci. In just a few lessons, he'll teach Joanna the rudiments of a healthy diet. The first lesson is choosing good products. The first very important point is that fruits and vegetables have different amounts of vitamins and antioxidants according to their colors. A rule to remember is that you should always try to have at least three different colors of vegetables on your plate. If you buy the raw products, there are no labels on them, but you're sure of what you have on your plate, of what's on it and going in your body. And it's obvious that what you put in your body three times a day for your entire life is bound to have a major influence. Here, we're going to make something very simple. It's just a plain red curry squash and red lentil soup. The advantage of red lentils is that they don't need to be soaked or cooked for very long. It's always good to begin with a few raw vegetables. By masticating, we awaken the digestive system. We're just going to make a little stuffing of avocados, olives and basil very, very quickly. The coach shows Joanna that these recipes are very healthy, but not at all time-consuming. It's always good to try to use either onions, shallots or garlic. They're very, very good for our health. They contain sulfur compounds that are very good, particularly for the skin, the hair, because beauty counts as well. For the final touch, anything that's spicy. We'll add a touch of cumin. It's much more interesting than salt for enhancing the flavor of a dish. And then you just let it simmer for about 35 minutes. What's good is that you just have to reheat a single bowl afterwards. And it's very quick to reheat.
Will the family appreciate these homemade recipes? Too good. She usually likes a lot of salt in her food. But here there was no salt at all. But she liked it. Didn't even ask for the salt. That's great. And now to taste the soup. Thank you. You hungry, Noemi? You want more? You're going to taste the soup first. It's good. Come on. Let's taste it. Oh, it's good. <laughs> Anybody else for a taste? Noemi. Noemi refuses the soup. A bit of salt might change her mind. It's not easy to change people's eating habits, but it's well worth it. Fewer chemicals in our plates, savings for the health services as well as our own pocketbooks, and return to the kitchens of our grandmothers without being riveted to a stove all day. Is this to be the cuisine of the future?